years ago, back in eighth grade, and we won't count how many years ago that was, I did what most youth in my church did before Easter. I loaded into a van and I journeyed to the Alto Frio Baptist Encampment to participate in the annual pre-Easter retreat. Now, unlike summer camp, this was only about a day and a half long, and it was a bit less structured with a lot of free time to get into trouble. I chose to spend my free time on the, the banks of the Frio River, you know, the one that was in the George Strait song that I loved so much. I was really excited about the location. It was really cold, by the way. Lived up to its name. I spent so much time there squatting and watching the river flow through narrow passages, over rocks and under fallen branches. It was so peaceful. Like I was transported to a, a calmer place, a meditative place. That was the place I first remember ever encountering God. God. I remember the still, small voice speaking and reframing the motions of the river that I was seeing as an allegory for life, and the sticks that were floating through almost unencumbered by the challenges that they were facing as an allegory for my life floating in the chaos with God for direction. I was beyond excited. I journeyed to that spot every time I was at the encampment, hoping, praying to encounter God again. But it never happened at the exact same spot. It never happened when I was expecting it to. But then that's the thing about journeys to God that we don't often talk about. You often don't find God at the journey that you were expecting. Well, at least you don't find God the way you were looking for. The Bible's filled with stories of people who were on journeys when they encountered God. Moses unexpectedly encountered God when he was journeying in the desert. Jeremiah was asleep. And the first woman since Eve to encounter God was in one of the darkest moments of her life. See, Hagar encountered God multiple times in the book of Genesis. And for those not familiar with her story, the first time she encountered God, she was still a slave to Abraham and Sarah. And that first time, it was just after she had conceived Ishmael when she was just starting to show. And she became one of the only women in Scripture to enter into covenant with God. She wasn't seeking God at the spring that she found herself at, but she still encountered God there. Her second encounter, though, she was a free woman. She was set free into the wilderness because Sarah couldn't stand the sight of Ishmael. She couldn't bear the thought that it wasn't her son that was going to get Abraham's birthright. She was extremely jealous of Hagar. And so Abraham sent her away with a water skin and some bread. And Hagar and Ishmael, they ran out of supplies before they reached civilization. And Hagar, she couldn't bear to see her child die of starvation and dehydration. And so she placed him under a bush and she went about a bow's uh, distance away. And she sat down and she wept. We aren't told what she said, simply that she lifted her voice in anguish. Hagar's journey wasn't to God. It was kind of aimless, honestly. She set out in a direction hoping to find civilization. It was a journey from hardship and from pain. And there was no healing or joy on that journey. She was a woman that was broken. In the first story of Hagar, we're told that Sarah had dealt with her harshly, and it became obvious uh, that she'd conceived Abraham's child. She mistreated this woman so badly that Hagar ran away, and it was in her despair that she again encountered God. Her tears dried. She found there was a well next to her, and she was able to care for herself and for her child. You see, it wasn't on her journey that she gained healing and joy. It was in her encounter with God. We can look to another one of my favorite stories in Scripture, the woman at the well. That woman wasn't journeying to God. She was fetching a pail of water. Have you ever been so excited for a chore when you knew you were going to get some alone time and you turn the corner and there's a man just sitting there? <laughs> 
and you know you're about to get roped into small talk, (laughs) there's anguish in that story that we don't get to read about. But that's where the woman at the well found herself. The journey that she was taking was simply one to survive, probably cook a meal for herself and the man that she was living with. And she met this guy instead. She found Jesus. Jesus. And she recognized that he was Jewish, and later on that he was a prophet, and he had some authority. And so she held him into account for the wrongs his people had done to hers, only to have him reveal that she was encountering God. And she found such joy in that encounter that she went and she led her entire town to meet him and to encounter God once again by a well of water. Because it seems there's a a well of water in a lot of those stories. Last week, we discussed another encounter with God at the tomb. Luke's account of that morning, it says that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and a whole bunch of other women that we don't know the names of, they went to the tomb and they were greeted by messengers from God. And they rushed to tell the disciples, and Peter did what so many of us would. Peter went to where that encounter with God took place, hoping to find his own encounter, only to find it empty. John then tells us the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus. Those two men were walking. They were talking about the events of the resurrection, the things that the women had told them, the sadness of losing their friend and their rabbi. And they encountered a stranger. And they invited the stranger to eat with them while breaking bread. They finally recognized that they were encountering God. They again found joy in an encounter with God. Over and over in the stories, we see that it wasn't in the journey that people found healing or joy. It was in that encounter with God. Even in the stories where Jesus healed or worked miracles, the healing and joy weren't in the journey to Jesus. It was in the encounter with Jesus. But that shouldn't be surprising. It shouldn't be surprising that we we miss that sometimes because most of us have no idea what we're actually looking for when we talk about a journey to God. What does the end of that journey look like? What does a successful journey to God mean? As I mentioned before, rarely was God present at the end of a person's journey to encounter God in Scripture. After all of the journeys that I've been on in the many churches and denominations that I've been part of in my past, none of those led me to encountering God. Typically, the journey is more about, I guess, preparing yourself for the possibility of encountering God. Lessons about the journey often teach of the Lectio Divina, where you focus and you ruminate on on bits of Scripture and what they say to you, or on journaling or on silent meditation. Essentially, when God isn't typically present at the end of a journey, it's best that you prepare to just kind of stumble upon God. There's a really beautiful song by Larnell Harris called I Miss My Time With You, and it speaks of God sitting, waiting for us to return. The chorus is God speaking to us, telling us how much God has missed that special time with us. But the second verse of the song, it, it almost gets what our response should be. What do I have to offer? How can I truly care? My efforts have no meaning when your presence isn't there. But you'll provide the power if I take time to pray. I'll stay right here beside you and you'll never have to say I miss my time with you those moments together and it okay you get the idea go look it up on spotify or youtube wherever you get your music from great song i promise i had it on repeat and annoyed my mother with it as a teenager it was wonderful but the theology of the song isn't fully in keeping with how easy those encounters are for us as we're told by jesus jesus hints that there's an easy way to encounter god in our daily lives We simply have to stop hoping for an encounter with this biblically contrived image of God that we've built and begin hoping that we recognize the image of God in each person that we encounter. Look around you. 
Go on, seriously, look, look around you. Each face that you see is a reflection of the image of God. Take a moment right now and turn to your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and let them know that you can see God in them. Okay, come on. You're telling someone that you can see God in them. <laughs> and you're, you're whispering like, I don't know that you're doing it. Some of you guys talk during the service louder than that. Seriously, turn to your neighbor and joyfully let them know you see God in them. <laughs> okay, and there's the danger of letting the congregation start talking during the sermon. You're not quite sure when they're going to stop. Let's, let's all come back. Okay. There's a theological debate on whether you have to see all of humanity in order to see the reflection of God or if that reflection shows from each individual. But frankly... It doesn't matter. Whatever you do to these, the least of your siblings, you do to God, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Friends, our journeys take us past God every single day. But we are so focused on that small voice or the strange warming of our hearts or that, that tingle that you feel that we forget to look for God in the eyes of the person that we're passing by. We might be nice to them, give money to the poor, even advocate for the marginalized, but few of us remember to look for God within those people. Heck, as full of ourselves as we can become, few of us remember to look for God within the person that we see in the mirror every day. It's interesting. So many of us are more prepared to give reverence to a disembodied voice or a tingle, but not the spark of life and image of God within the people around us. But friends, that's something that we can start changing today. Prayer time occasionally is fine. And self-care to recharge is something that I preach to the nurses that I work with every single day. I'm sure they're getting tired of hearing it and they will revolt eventually. <laughs> but remembering that your healing and your joy come from those encounters with God and those encounters come with every person you meet means that opportunity is always around you. So starting today, let's put aside the platitudes. Don't just be polite because it's the nice thing to do. Treat each person that you encounter as though you met them at the tomb or saw them at the well or they joined you on a journey. Treat them all as an encounter with God. Thank you, Carolyn. <clears throat> Friends, as you are able, let us tackle.